Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery. This will be part 367 in our series. We're continuing with a lesson titled, The Life Promised Versus The Life Lived. This will be part three. Now, Scripture teaches <clears throat> the new creation, unlike the old, is a being of light. The old creation, Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 2, 7, is a creature of matter. The new creation is a creation of light, crafted for life in the realms of light. Life in the heavens is radically different from life in the earth. Life in the realm of light is radically different than life in the realm of matter. And because of the vast differences, we're going to take a look at the crafting of the new creation, the creation of light. Scripture teaches life in the heavens is lived in the medium of light. In Colossians, the first chapter, verse 12. giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So what we find here, not only is the saint composed of light, not only is the destiny of the saint in the realm of light, but everything that the saint partakes of, inherits, is going to be a form of light. It's going to be found in the element of light, never the element of matter or anything lower than the element of light. In that vein, we want to take a look at some principles dealing with the light reality. Scripture teaches God is light personified. God is light personified. God is light. He creates in light. He dwells in light. Turn to Revelation, the fourth chapter, verse 2 to 3. John is called up to heaven and told to record what he sees. Verse 2 of chapter 4. Immediately I was in the spirit and beheld a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now what is John trying to describe? First of all, he says he sees a throne sitting in heaven, and he sees a figure on the throne. He cannot give a detail of what this figure looks like because he's blinded by the radiance that the figure emanates. So all he can give is a description of what the light that he is perceiving looks like. And he says, like a jasper. 
Now, what we find, jasper is a stone which emanates reddish, yellow, and brown light. It's a, a gemstone with these qualities. When you look at it, you're going to see red, yellow, and brown emanating from it. And he also goes on to say, in a sardine stone. Sardine is a sardius which has a reddish emanation coming from a very powerful reddish emanation. <clears throat> he says, a rainbow was around the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So he's a, he's a prism of light dominated by the color of an emerald. The emerald, of course, is bright green. So what John sees is a consistent emanation of colors coming from the throne, this figure that is emanating the light that is overshadowing the figure. But what John sees is a color emanating from him, the prismatic lights <coughs> that's uh, basically streaming from the figure, powerful light emanations. So powerful, John now is in the spirit and he's barely able to describe what he's seeing. <clears throat> Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches God, who is light, has predestinated the prototokist sons which are called in eternity to look exactly like his son. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 29. Romans 8, 29. <clears throat> For whom he did foreknow, for whom he had a relationship with prior to the earthly relationship, who he did foreknow, this takes place in eternity, he also did predestinate. Now the word to be is in italics, it's not in the original Greek. Because if you read it in the original Greek, it's putting it off in the future somewhere, to be conformed. That is not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying, whom he did for no, he also did predestinate, conformed to the image of his son, that he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the father predestinated, willed, that these prototokist sons would take on the very image of his son in every aspect, characteristic, appearance, and the attributes of light that his son emanates. Now what we find fulfilling this, or bringing this to its completion, is that his son looks and acts exactly as he, the father, does. So in Hebrews, the first chapter, verses two to three, Hebrew is the first chapter, verses 2 to 3. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, or the ages. Who, being the brightness of glory, or the Father's glory, and the express image of of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what he's saying here is the son looks exactly like the father. 
So the way the father is described, so is the son. The way the son is described, so are the prototokis sons that have been predestinated from eternity to be conformed to the son. So in essence, what we find is the father is crafting all the sons to look and act the same. They have the same stamp, the image of his son, who is his image. <clears throat> so what you see here, when you see John describing the father on his throne, all the sons are acting the same way, although John doesn't describe it in that way. We find that as you look at activities taking place in the heavens, this emanation of light is periodically being attributed to the suns. That's the way they're going to function in eternity. In the realms of light as light. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches at the new birth the saint, the newborn saint, manifests light because he's a creature of light, a creation of light. But he manifests light as an infant, at an infantile level. He manifests light on the lowest level and needs the word of God to allow his light level to increase. Just as humans need food to gain energy to grow, so does the newborn saint need the word to energize his light and enable it to increase. Turn to the book of 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verse 2. First Peter, second chapter, verse two. <clears throat> As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. Understand that everything you find that is attributed to the new creation is in terms of light. Being fed as a babe is in terms of expanding your light. You're feeding so that you can grow, so that your light can intensify. The only way a babe grows is by ingesting the word of God and applying the word of God so that he can begin to manifest as a sentient being. Just like a human baby, if he doesn't get food, he starves. If he gets food, then he can ingest food and the system begins to operate. He can begin to function by continually being fed. The same is true for the babe of light. Now, <clears throat> Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow. You grow to a point where you are established as an infant functioning in the body of Christ, learning every day. Scripture teaches, if the saint stays at the infant level, he does not go beyond the milk stage, he cannot operate in a position of responsibility. In other words, his light will remain in an infant state of brightness. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, Verse 13. 
For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. At a babe's position, <coughs> anybody that's a babe puts himself in this <coughs> illustration, if you will. Verse 12, same chapter. <clears throat> for when for the time you ought to be teachers, in other words, they're still babes, they should have gone on. Their light is the light of babes. For when you ought to be teachers, you have need to one teach you again, which, is, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. What is he saying here? He's saying if you don't go beyond the baby stage, you're going to retrograde until the point where you need to be fed milk again. In the realm of light, there is no cessation of motion. Light is always in motion. And in this respect, the babe has to be put in motion. If he does not continue to progress in motion, he's going to retrograde. He's going to lose what he originally had. And in this respect, right of the book of Hebrews is remonstering the church of the Hebrews because they have not grown beyond the babe stage. Saying you need meat. You cannot continue on the milk that you're being fed. Now we want to take a look at what they consider milk at this point. In other words, they're being castigated because they're being fed this repetitive milk level of a word which is really doing them no good. It's not enabling them to grow beyond the baby stage. What is it that they're being fed? Scripture teaches the milk level <coughs> includes teachings of repentance, salvation through faith, the baptisms, the resurrection of the Lord's coming, and eternal judgment, healings and imparting of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Hebrews 6 chapter, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, having the principles of the doctrine of Christ, <coughs> basic faith foundation, let us go on unto perfection, maturity, and not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands. This basically is the doctrine of healings and impartation of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. And of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. What is he saying? He's saying let's go on from that. He's saying you don't need to hear a salvation message anymore. You're no longer a babe. You need to progress into the mature things. If you remain at this level, what does he say <coughs> about remaining on this baby level? He's saying, <coughs> basically, <coughs> that as babes, you remain unskillful in the word of righteousness. Now let's focus on this a minute. Verse 13, chapter 5. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now this is significant. Because what he's saying is. If you remain on this level 
of receiving milk as a doctrine, you will never reach the point in which you can discern to, to discern good from evil in the word of God. In other words, you're wide open to deceptions. Why? Because you're a babe. You can't discern for yourself. You have to go on to be presented with meat. Yes. Now this is the word of God we are looking at here. The word of God is saying, <clears throat> once you have been given the basic foundation, don't, don't, don't repeatedly go over it ad nauseum because you are not allowing those that you are in authority over to progress. They're creatures of light. They need to be given meat that will cause their light to intensify. Yes. So now we know from Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, why the very first thing, the very first thing that Jesus said to the three questions, when? What's it going to look like? Then? What's it going to happen? He didn't directly answer those questions. The first thing he said was, do not be deceived. Exactly. The very first thing. That's it. Right there. <coughs> exactly. So, I'm not surprised. We see it. Exactly. Exactly. You cannot grow in organized religion. It's designed to keep you at a baby level. You see, nobody would believe what you just said. It's designed to keep one at a baby level. Yes. That couldn't be comprehended by the, um, the, the leadership as well, would not believe what we're saying. They couldn't comprehend it. Still in all, this is what they teach at the seminary. Sure. That the gospel is the gospel of salvation. Yeah. The only gospel. And the idea is the goal is to get saved, which flies in the face of what the scripture is saying. The goal is to grow to the point where you reach maturity. You have to go beyond the milk level. Doctrine of Christ, laying on of hands, repentance from dead works, all that is milk. Yeah. I've heard people say that they're going to concentrate on the Great Commission, believing that anything beyond the Great Commission, contrary to what it says here, <coughs> can't be correct. It has to be from the end. They believe that. <coughs> yes. What's interesting, looking at it from the standpoint of what the scripture says, you are a creation of light. Now, what we find in the scripture is the principle of light. You can even look at it from this level. Light operates in such a way that it manifests what is called wavelength frequency. Science breaks down sunlight through a prism, through a, a, a glass that breaks the light down to its component parts. And we find that light is composed of levels of <coughs> wave frequencies. The wave frequencies go from ultraviolet to infrared. The wave frequencies, each wave has a specific length. And the length of the light wave determines what its color is. The largest light waves, ultraviolet. The smallest light waves, infrared. The smaller light waves, frequencies <coughs> operate at a more rapid rate than the larger light wave frequencies. <coughs> so you have a stratified level of light emanation. The frequency determines the color, the wavelength determines the characteristic of the light. The heavens are composed of light. They operate also on frequency wavelength levels. When the Lord created the heavens and the hosts of them, he spoke them in as creatures of light, operating off of the characteristics of light. Each one operates on a frequency level. The lower heavens have 
frequency wavelengths that characterize them on more of a baser level than the higher frequency heavens. Commensurate with the growth of the saint as you progress as a child of light your frequency level begins to increase. Your color spectrum which is a reflection of the frequency level changes. Becomes more and more dense. More and more radiant. Put it that way. Until you reach a point you become a mature light emanator. What did Jesus say? Let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What does that mean? That means that God designed the Prototokis saint to reach a level of maturity where his light would manifest his calling. Two callings. Priest or king. In the church, those that will be kings on earth are administrators, organizers, those that can engage in things of direction of masses. <clears throat> their light enables them to manifest their calling successfully every single time. <clears throat> the priest, the teacher, the instructor, reaches a light level in which he can maneuver and manipulate <coughs> to manifest the meaning of the word to others so that they can comprehend and understand. Let your light so shine <coughs> that men may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is, oh, that person knows the word of God. It's not that person you're glorifying, it's God who enabled that person to comprehend. If a person doesn't find his calling, he cannot manifest his light. So the incremental ascendance which you're describing cannot begin until somebody is enlightened enough that they receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, I guess that's the best way to say it. Because it's only at that point that the calling becomes apparent to the person, and that person is aware that that's the thing they're supposed to be. Well, yes. The way the body of Christ was designed, the, uh, <coughs> the teacher is to petition the Father to bring into the life the spirit of wisdom of wis wisdom and revelation. Because the babe doesn't have the understanding to do that. That's why Paul says, I'm praying that the Father will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's the job of the teacher, of the person that's discipling the babe. So that prayer is a necessary action of the teacher. Yes, it's not optional. It's not optional. Yeah. You, have a, you have a child has been birthed into the body of Christ is your responsibility to develop. And the first part of your responsibility is to have that child enlightened as to so he can pursue what his calling is and what his inheritance is. That's a lifelong pursuit. If he's ignorant of it, what's the result of that going to be? Well, the result of that is going to be when he leaves his life, the best that he can hope for is to spend eternity as a babe. Sure. If he spends eternity as a babe, he cannot enter into the heavens because only those that have responsible positions will inhabit the kingdom of the heavens. He's going to spend his life on the new earth. To what degree should the student, once the student has recognized that his teacher has petitioned, to what degree should the student petition for himself on a regular basis? Well, the student at that point is going to be guided into understanding what has been petitioned. This is what is coming to you. It's the student's job to pursue that until he receives it. So they both work together. But they have to understand. 
uh, <coughs> the student has to understand from a student's level so that he can progress to a higher degree of maturity. The body of Christ was never meant to be secretive, never meant to have one group have access to everything at the expense of the other group. Revelation knowledge was given for all to receive on the same scale. Organized religion is the one that gives you part, it basically portions out authority. I'm a pastor, I'm a deacon, you're a church member. You have class levels, organized religion. That was never God's intention for the body of Christ. It says you are members in general. So what we find here, we are looking here at God's plan, a progression for the, <coughs> the babe to gain understanding and then to go on to progress to a point where he can discern truth from error in the word. When that happens, he becomes mature. He at that point fits into a position in the body of Christ because he knows what his calling is and he knows what the pursuit of his inheritance will entail. We read last night about that. Turn to Philippians. Third chapter. This is to be the mind of the mature saint as he relates to his position in the body of Christ and his calling in the body of Christ. Philippians, the third chapter, starting in verse 12, down to verse 15. None as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that if that I may be apprehended that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So in other words, you never stand still. You have to consistently be in motion, moving toward a goal. Reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All the saying, this is what I do. I focus on the goal, and I'm consistently in motion toward that goal. Always have a goal in front of you. Something that you are striving to achieve which is in your calling. If you are an elder, then you put something in your life in which you are striving to better yourself. If you are a teacher, you progress in consistently growing in revelation knowledge. Always be progressing towards something you are trying to attain until you reach the final goal when you cross the finish line and you've completed your course. Paul goes on to say, verse 15, let us, let us, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, mature, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, this is the, the marching order for the saint, the prototokos, or the temporal call, whichever. Find out what your calling is, find out what your inheritance is, busy yourself progressing toward your destiny. What is it you are called to do? What is it you have inherited in Christ? Petition the Holy Spirit to give you understanding, comprehension. It takes a lifetime to pursue so you gain to the total comprehension of the totality of what it is. Because you have to progress from the, the point of, of a babe 
to a point of maturity. Now, different people progress in different rates. Some people just bang, they're gone. And in a short period of time, they've amassed a large amount of revelation knowledge. Others may take a longer time, but it doesn't matter. As long as you have determined in your mind, this is what you want to do, and you do not allow yourself to slack in, you do not allow yourself to give you a rationale for not doing what you know you should do, God is going to give you the ability to do it. And he's going to make a way in which what you desire ultimately will come into your life. This is what Paul is saying. And Paul is also saying, the person that <clears throat> slackens off, God is going to remind them, hey, you're not doing what you should do. You're wasting your time. <clears throat> now whether the individual acquiesces to that, that's up to them. But God is faithful. God called us for a purpose. God's not going to suddenly look around and uh, look at uh, what's happening someplace else at our expense. He's, his eye is totally on us, on the path that he ordained for us to walk. The Holy Spirit is right there, <coughs> listening to what God has to say to the Holy Spirit about us, and immediately carrying it out. If there's a problem, it's not with God, it's with us. And ultimately, turn to Revelation, second chapter. Ultimately, when you cross the finish line, you cross the finish line as an overcomer. Yeah. Revelation, second chapter. When do you get to be an overcomer? At the rapture. When uh, you become adopted and glorified. Revelation, the second chapter. Picking it up. Verse 26 to 27. <coughs> he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power, authority over the nations. These are to be the kings of the kingdom. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Now you read an example of this, of course, in uh, Isaiah, who talks about the second coming, the king <coughs> who's been given authority over the nations, <coughs> comes riding in on a cloud in glory and power, wiping out everything in front of him, bringing into subjectivity every deviant spirit, casting it off the earth, <coughs> changing the uh, total composition of um, peoples and places, bringing them into the conformity of the kingdom. That's what the king is going to do. Now, Revelation, the third chapter. <coughs> Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. This is the priest. He shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. This is the temp the pillar angel in the temple who has the name of the Father himself etched in him forever. When he makes a determination, when he makes a decree, <coughs> it's, as if, it's as if the Father has made the decree personally. You read in Revelation, the voice comes from heaven making declarations that affect the whole creation. This is the destiny of those that will reign at the highest level of authority in God's creation. Now, each one of them will operate. They will be lights. They will be perceived as John perceived the Father in Revelation, the fourth chapter. Emanating when you when you allow your glory to radiate, <clears throat> it's going to be a prismatic emanation of brilliance, a color spectrum that will dazzle everybody in the creation. It will make what Lucifer's beauty 
once was pale into insignificance. <clears throat> it talks about, Daniel talks about, he's given a vision of the Father on the throne. I think it's somewhere around Revelation, I mean, uh, Daniel, uh, the ninth chapter, somewhere around there. He sees fire coming from the throne, emanating into vast areas beyond the throne. Myriads of angels surrounding the Father, waiting for His directive and instantaneously going off whatever direction the Father indicates that they should go, what they should do. Sons are going to have the same type of authority. Ruling, reigning, uh, declaring the Father as all in all in every corner of the creation, bringing the fallen creation back into operating significance after the plan and the pattern of the Father's direction. They're going to restore all things to what they once were and to a greater degree than they once were. This is the destiny of the sons of light. What we find is that in each individual to get the vision, apply it to yourself, and then move out and make it your own.